The following is a special presentation from Pastor Joanne Ramsey and Speak the Word Ministries. We trust God's Word will bless you as you listen to this message. Here's Pastor Joe. He says in Jeremiah 1 verse 5 in the voice translation, he says, before I ever, before I even formed you in your mother's womb, he says, I knew you. Before you drew your first breath, he said, I had already chosen you to be my prophet, to speak my word, he says, to the nations. And Jeremiah said, oh Lord, he says, I'm too young and too inexperienced, he says, to speak for you. And then the Lord said to Jeremiah, don't use your mouth as an excuse. He says, you can and you will go wherever I send you. You can and you will say whatever I tell you to say. He says, you have no reason to fear the people that you, he says, you have no reason to fear the people that you speak to for he says, I am with, with you. And he says, I will defend you. He says, and then Jeremiah, then the Lord reached out and touched Jeremiah's mouth and he gave him his divine message. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, look, he said, I have placed my words in you. And he says, you will know what to say and you will be my voice. This very day, he said, I appointed you to speak with my authority over nations and kingdoms. He said, your word, and this is the voice translation, but where we recognize and realize it or not, we are God's voice. And this is what he was telling Jeremiah. And in the voice translation, it reads, he says, your word, your word and my word. He says, will have the power, he says, to uproot and stamp out. He says, it will destroy, he says, and he says, it will upend. He says, and then your word, my word, he says, will rebuild and plant anew. Hallelujah. So we have to understand that we are God's vessels here on this earth. We are his mouthpiece. And that when we speak the word of God, it has the same power behind it as it has when God himself is speaking it. And that he created us in his image. I want you to pause and I want you to think for just a second what God said to Jeremiah. Because saints, has not God spoken the same things to us in the New Testament that he spoke to Jeremiah? Has God not spoken the same things to us? Did he not create us in his image and in his likeness, giving us dominion over everything? According to Genesis 1.26, he says he gave us dominion over all of the earth and every creeping thing. Has he not given us the same authority to speak to the mountains and, and speak to our situations? He says in Mark eleven twenty three 23 that he has. Yes, amen. Amen. According to Luke 10, 19, he has given us the same authority that he gave Jeremiah. Actually, what we have, brothers and sisters, is far more superior to what Jeremiah had, for we have the whole trinity living inside of us. Yes. Jeremiah didn't have the whole trinity living on the inside of him. You know, in the Old Testament, you know, a lot of people are trying to live with one foot in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament, but you can't do that. You can't, you, the reason why you're not receiving your miracles and getting your prayers answered is because you're trying to operate in two kingdoms. That's right. That's right. So you're going to have to keep both your feet in one place yes. in order to experience the, the freedom that God has died to give us. Are you, are you hearing me? We have the Holy Spirit himself lives in us. And has God not given us his word to speak? He has given us his word to speak. The Lord has given us everything that we need to combat any situation. There's not a circumstance or a situation that can face you this morning that he has not prepared you or given you a word for. Because he said, if you go back to Genesis, he said, I have given you a seed for everything. And God likens in Luke, he likens his word to the seed. So he has given us a seed for everything. Everything, whether you recognize it or not, everything, it, is, it comes from a seed. Everything on this earth comes from a seed, including you. Amen. We were all, we were a seed Amen. first. Yes, yes. Amen. The incorruptible seed. Amen. That's what we are. We were we made of incorruptible seed. Hallelujah. Amen. However... We have let fear and doubt and religious traditions rob us of everything that God wanted for us. Paul warns us. He says, beware of requirements invented, he says, by humans. He says, in other words, beware of religious traditions. In Colossians 2, 
verses 8 and 10 in New Living Bible says, Be careful not to let anyone rob you of this faith through a shallow and misleading philosophy. He says, Such a person follows human traditions and the world's way of doing things rather than following Christ. All of God lives in Christ's body, and God has made you complete in Christ. Complete. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. Christ is in charge of every ruler and every authority. And it says in 1 Corinthians six seventeen that whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. You know, I, I think, you know, I have a hard time understanding some things. I accept it because the word says it's true. But sometimes I have a hard time understanding that I am the same as Christ. That he's living in me, that I'm living in him. But the Bible says that he is one with the Father. The Father is one with him, and we are one with him. So if that means that we're one with him, we're the same. And if we're the same, then we can do those greater works that he says that we can do. He says, I'm going, he says, the greater works he says you can do, he says, because I'm going to be with the Father, so I'm leaving you down here to do those greater works that I'm talking about. Amen. So, but we don't, we think that it's sacrilegious or too spiritual, or too religious, or too something, that we, we don't have the ability and authority to do what God says we can do. But we need to be acting like Him. We need to be walking around. We need to be speaking to the lame, and to the blind, and, and, and to the deaf. We need to be seeing demonstrations of the work of the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't just be talking about it. We should be experiencing it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. I was so blessed in Hillsville at the revival I did up there to, uh, for the first time ever, praying over someone in a wheelchair and actually have them get up. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. But you know, the Lord prepares you, and, and I, I'm getting emails from her almost every day. Uh, she still hasn't got all of her strength back, but she's walking some every day. She even danced a little bit. And I forgot exactly what she had, it was M something, I don't know if it was MS, whatever. But anyway, she'd been in there for a long time. But her name's Melissa. And uh, she might even be listening online this morning as she is. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Keep dancing. <laughs> but you know, it, it's so awesome because the Lord kept putting in my spirit before we went there. He kept putting in my spirit about um, uh, Peter and John. You know, he brought this verse back to my remembrance, you know, in Acts, you know, when uh, Peter and John approached a man at the gate, you know, and they had been lame, and he, they brought him there every day, you know, so he could get money, you know, from the people, you know, that went by. And when Peter and Paul went by, you know, he looked at them, and he was expecting uh, Peter and Paul to give him some money, but Peter looked at him, and he says, silver I have none, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus get up and walk Amen. and so he kept impressing that into my spirit and the lord said to me he said there is no difference between peter and you joe there's no difference in the spirit it's the same it's the self same spirit that was living in peter and john that's living in you and me if you're a born again believer this morning that self same spirit is living in us and, and so he said, you, you, you know, you can, you can speak the same as he did. We have to understand that we are God's representatives. We are his ambassadors, and we have the power and the authority to, to speak. But what I was going to say is that we don't feel like that we can do those things, but he says that we have that same power living on the inside of us that, that Peter had. And so, like I said, he kept bringing that verse back to me, a uh, week or two before I went up to Hillsville to do the revival, and he had it embedded in me, and I prayed for her last. I prayed for some other people that were healed. One of the teachers there that runs the school had her hand healed, and actually she had her hand healed. I didn't pray over her, but Sandy, one of the uh, people there, uh, she's one of their teachers there, um, she, as I was demonstrating with uh, someone else, laying my hand on this other person and speaking and telling them what to say. She was repeating, without me knowing it, she was repeating what I was saying. And when she got through repeating what I was saying and what to say to that, you know, if you had this problem in the hand. And when I went to demonstrate, I didn't know what I was going to use to demonstrate, but the Lord impressed upon me to use her hand. 
but her hand was healed. And I got an email from her the other day. She said, it's still, it's still healed. It's, it's still working good. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I, I guess my point is that, you know, you don't really even have to pray for someone. The Bible never even said pray anyway. He said, just lay your hands on them. He said, just lay your hands on them, you know. So really, when we come, we shouldn't really say you come up to a prayer line. Just come up to a healing line. Yes. Yes. Just come up to a healing line, not a prayer line, a healing line. Yeah. You know, because he didn't tell us anything about praying. Hallelujah. You know, when a child of God prays and speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Hell hears and obeys. Amen. Are you hearing me? Yeah. When we speak, heaven hears he obeys, heaven obeys, and God will back up his word. Yeah. And like I said, hell hears, and he's going to obey and get out of your way. So therefore, let me remind you that you are the one with the authority here. Also remind you that you can never, ever, ever let your guard down when it comes to your enemy, Satan, because he's always looking for a way to get in. First Peter 5 Eight, in the voice translation, it says, most importantly, he said, be disciplined and stay on guard. He said, for your enemy, the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, just waiting and hoping for a chance to devour someone. So keep up your guard. As a matter of fact, the title to my message today is keep up your guard. We need to keep our guards up at all times. And you can never, ever underestimate him. He is your adversary. And as Jesus told Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift each of you like wheat. He said, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail in Luke 22, 31. Saints, all of us track through the valley of failure and we come up short sometimes. But Peter had a life altering failure. Jesus warned that Satan had asked permission to sift the disciple like wheat. Are you aware that it takes a lot of vigorous shaking to separate wheat kernels from debris? The enemy, he wanted to shake Peter's faith so hard in hopes that he'd fall away from Jesus like chafe. One definition for chafe is worthless matter. Another definition, it says that chafe is the husk of grains and grasses that are separated during threshing. When Satan sifts believers, his goal is to damage our faith so much that we become useless to God. That's what he does. He wants to sift you. In other words, you could use the other word as tempt you, entice you, sift you, to get you to fall away from the Lord. Are you hearing me? He wants to stop you from your kingdom assignment. Therefore, he goes after your strengths, the areas where we believe ourselves to be invincible or at least very well protected. Sometimes we fool ourselves and we think that we're protected in certain areas. And so we don't get as, we, we uh, kind of let our guards down. And you can never let your guard down. You can never let your guard down. And saints, if Satan succeeds in causing you to fail, you're going to feel disappointed and you're probably going to feel demoralized, just like Peter did. But don't, you don't have to stay that way. We all know that Peter swore up and down that he would never let Jesus down. And he really believed in his heart that he wouldn't. You know, there's sometimes I think, Lord, I would never do that. And in my heart, I really don't think I would. But then sometimes I find myself doing things that I thought I never would. Not really what you say, what I would think is awful things or say things. You know, the other night I was watching a movie. Actually, it was a kind of like a series that I've watched from time to time, David and I. And, and usually, mostly it's kind of funny. And uh, it doesn't have a, you know, a lot of blood and gore and stuff in it because you have to be so careful what you watch and what you listen to. You know, you, you can't because the enemy's going to sneak in on those things, you know, whether it's music or TV programs or radio, whatever, he's going to sneak in and plant those seeds, you know, in your mind, you know, and they're going to become your thoughts and your thoughts, you know, become words and your words become action. So it's, it's kind of like that. But I, I was watching it and, and it was a two-part and it was double trouble. 
because I sat there and I watched it. And of course, after I watched the first, you know, naturally I wanted to see what's going to happen to the second part. I want to know who did it. Uh, <laughs> so I, I watched the second part. Uh, during the second part, I, I began to feel not good. I, I knew, I, I was beginning to think, that I know I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. Because in this particular episode, there, there were a lot of blood and gore, even some witchcraft in it. You know, I mean, they snuck a little of that in. And it got through, and I told David, I said, I feel so bad. I, I hurt so bad. Because I'm, I'm grieving because I know I grieve the one that loves me so much. But, but because, see, what I watch and listen to, he has to hear too. Have you ever thought about that? He lives in us. So whatever we tune into and watch, he has to too. Wherever we go, we take him with us. So he sees and hears everything we see and hear. And there's times we grieve him. And the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So I grieved him. And that whole night, I, I, I was restless. I didn't sleep well because I couldn't. You know, you get those images. You, get, you can get good images in your mind, and you get bad images in your mind. And, and it seems like, for some reason or other, it's harder to get those bad images out of your mind once they're planted there. It's really hard. And I tried all night trying to think of something else. I tried to keep capturing those thoughts so I could think of something else. But I kept seeing this, these scenes, you know. And the Lord knew that. He didn't, want, he didn't want me having those types of images in my mind, you know, affecting me. You know, and, I, and, I, and yesterday I was watching something else and I told David, I said, I really needed to watch that. I was watching this good Christian movie and the power of God and stuff. And I said, I feel like I just took another shower. <laughs> you know, because that's the way you feel when you, when you realize maybe you've watched something you shouldn't or listened to something you shouldn't or maybe you got into in, in a conversation. I was reading that in the Bible the other day. It said, if, if, you get, if you find yourself in a conversation that's not good, go. Depart. Get away from it. You know, don't get involved in it. And it, that is one thing that's so easy to do is to get involved in a conversation that's not going the way it should be going because it doesn't take long for it to be going in a different direction. Yeah. Hallelujah. He says, but you don't have to stay that way. See, I didn't have to stay that way. If you're willing, God can use your failure to do spiritual house cleaning. Peter laid down his pride. And instead, he put on the Holy Ghost spirit, uh, the Holy Ghost courage. Amen. Peter used that failure as a catalyst that brought forth greater faith and true servanthood. So if some of us in here this morning or some of us listening online feel like that you have failed God big time or that you've done something wrong. Maybe it was a movie or whatever. Maybe it was something you're just watching. You're feeling bad about it. Maybe you were gossiping about somebody or maybe you're being critical about somebody or maybe you went someplace you shouldn't have gone God can use that. He's not, he'll forgive you and he won't hold it against you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when he forgives you, he forgets it immediately and he never remembers it anymore, that he puts it his way as far as the east is from the west to remember no more. So he's never going to bring it up to you again. Now, Satan might do that and probably will, but God never will bring anything up. The Bible says, now, therefore, there is no condemnation for him that's in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. So we don't have to put up with that. Thanks to our Father, we have been given an armor that will protect us if we would just put it on. In Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, in the voice, it says, Finally, brothers and sisters, draw your strength and your might from God and put on the full armor of God to protect yourselves from the devil and from his evil schemes. Know that he has placed you in a position of authority. We need to know that God himself has placed us in a position of authority, seated at his right hand. According to Ephesians 2, 6, he raised us up and made us to sit. Also remember, too, that no soldier ever goes into battle without being aware of their enemy's strategy, and neither should we. Yeah. Second Timothy 2 and 4, Paul was telling Timothy, 
He said, Timothy, I want you to remember that no soldiers, you know, he was um, one of Timothy's mentors and Timothy was very young. And, and he said, remember that soldiers on active duty don't get wrapped up in civilian matters. He said, because their aim is to satisfy and please the one who listed him. Hallelujah. And I know that's true because I was associated with the military for about 30 years. My husband that was deceased was in the, an officer in the military. And, and so I, I'm familiar with how the military works, <laughs> you know, and they, and they stay focused. They do not get involved in civilian stuff. They, they stay focused on what they're supposed to be doing. And that is what you are. You are a soldier. Yeah. We're all in here this morning. If you're a born-again believer, you are a soldier in God's army. Saints, you know, as I was thinking this morning, I'm always asking the Lord what he wants me to share with you, what, what your needs are or what he wants you to hear, because I don't have a clue what your needs are or what you need to hear, but I, our Heavenly Father knows. <laughs> so I say, Lord, what can I share with your soldiers in this message? What can I say that will help them in their battles and in their struggles? What can I tell them that will help them to live the abundant life that Jesus died to give them? Father, what can I say to your soldiers that will make a difference this morning? Brothers and sisters, my prayer is that with every message I teach or preach, that it will give encouragement to those that are listening to it and will help you to be the victorious one in all your battles. For yes, you are in a spiritual battle. We all are. However, Paul says, I would not have you be ignorant of Satan's devices. In 2 Corinthians 2.11 in the voice translation, Paul was saying, it's my duty to make sure that Satan does not win even a small victory over us, for we don't want to be naive and then fall prey to his schemes. Remember what Jesus told Peter. He said, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. And I want you to know this morning that Jesus is praying for us too, brothers and sisters. The Bible says he is forever, he liveth to intercede for us. So he's interceding on our behalf all the time. And according to Romans 8, in the voice it says, can anyone be so bold as to level a charge against God's chosen? Especially since God's not guilty verdict is already declared, hallelujah. It says in verse 34, it says, Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. And I might add again where you and I are also seated. God wants us to fellowship with him on his level. And this is what we were talking about earlier. He said he wants us to fellowship with him on his level, and that level knows that we are seated with him in the heavenly places with, with every spiritual blessing. Yeah. We are to act like him. We are to talk like him, act like him, walk like him, work like him. You know, this is, I'm getting an understanding, more revelation to this, that when God sat down, he, he sat down, he completed his work. When Jesus came down, he did what the Lord sent him down here to do, his father. And then he's seated at the right hand of God, his father, until he comes back. When we became Christians, we became crucified with Christ. We died with him. Jesus died and he was raised again. When we became Christians, we died with him, the Bible says. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20 that we were crucified with Christ. And it's no longer us living, but the life that we live now in the flesh, we live in complete faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that gave his life for us. So we were crucified with him, made to sit with him. And so, in other words, if we are made to sit with him, then we are, are set down and finished with our works too. And then you think to yourself, well, if we finish with our works, who's going to get the work done? The Holy Spirit. Working through us. It's something we're learning all the time. I don't think we'll ever completely get it. But we're learning all the time that we cannot change anything or anybody through human efforts. They can only change or whatever can only change through the power of God. But if we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit 
and let him do the work inside of us, then we're always going to come out ahead. So what I'm saying is we're dead from our works, but not the work of the kingdom. But the work of the kingdom needs to be done strictly through the Holy Spirit, working through us. It's the only way anything's ever going to work. Where a preacher, where Pastor Larry's up here preaching, he preaches through the Holy Spirit. I preach as the Holy Spirit gives me utterance and pray that every time I walk up here, I know that the Holy Spirit is with me. And I always look down like he's standing here, but I know that he's in me. But I look down because I feel like I want to say, well, come on, Holy Spirit, let's go. You know that we're co-laborers together. And we're going to deliver this message today. And when I open my mouth, you're going to put your words in my mouth because half the things I've already said have been in my notes. So he, he is going to tell you, this is what I mean. Just say what he wants you to say and do what he wants you to do. And you're always going to come out ahead. Right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Satan has one plan for your life and one plan only, and that, you know, is to kill you. And he don't care how he does it or destroy you. He hates you, and he wants to destroy you because God loves you. So any battle you might be struggling with this morning, I want you to know that they are designed to make you give up. They're designed to make you quit. He was working on me yesterday and this morning too. Everything, <laughs> I, have to, I have to talk to myself all the time, whether I'm in the shower or whether I'm ministering the word or coming up to minister or I'm preparing the message. And I have to keep reminding myself every day that my feelings have nothing to do with my salvation. My feelings have absolutely nothing to do with who I am in Christ. My feelings, the Bible says, are the most evil things of all, and they will lie to me. (laughs) And so I have to keep reminding myself of who I am. Because if I listen to the enemy, you know, it's it's not good. (laughs) He would he would try to talk you out of doing what you need to be doing. Like I said earlier, he attacks his he attacks you in your strengths and in those areas to keep you from doing the work of the Lord. Yes, that's right. Hallelujah. Yes, Satan is a very real and he's a very deadly enemy. However, according to Colossians 3, 3 in the New Living Translation, it says, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. We're hidden in him. What happens when you hide something? You hide it. It's hidden. And he says we're hidden in him, I call this God's protection plan. You know, think about how the natural law protects someone who they want to use as a witness against another person. And by being a, a witness would put that person and their whole family in danger. You know, they call it the witness protection program. Have you ever heard of the witness protection program? You know, you got all these criminals going around and they finally go in and they interview them all and they grill them all and they finally get one that'll squeal. (laughs) And so they say, well, I tell you what, maybe he's the least of the evil. He was evil too, but he's the least of the evil. So we're going to put you in a protection plan, a witness protection plan. So what does the FBI tell them that they'll have to do in order to be in the witness protection plan? They tell them that they're going to have to cut off all their ties to the friends. You're going to have to get a new name. You're going to get a new job. Your children are going to have to learn their new names. They're going to get new schools. They cannot have any contact with anyone from their past. They can't have any phone calls. They can't have any emails. They have no nothing. They can't. They're in the witness protection program. Their life depends on it. If they make a phone call, and, and, and it has happened, where people just couldn't stay away and sent that letter or made that phone call and that was the end of them. Because see, like I said, like, like, like the Lord tells us in his word, like he just said, that your enemy, the devil, he's always roaming around looking for those that he may devour. The same as in the natural. Their enemy was looking for them. And figured that one of these, and they kept on the lookout, figuring that one day they would slip up. They would make a phone call. So what did they do? They watched the people that they're associated with, maybe their family or some other friends or something, because they figure sooner or later, they're going to contact them. And when they do, I got them. 
He said they will be totally cut off from their old life so that their enemy cannot find them in their new life. That, that's, that, that's the whole purpose of the witness protection program. Well, when you took on Christ's identity, you became a new creature in Christ and he has hidden you with him. Are you hearing me? And Colossians 3, 3 says, For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And as long as you don't go back to being your old self again, Satan can't find you. However, if you go back to watching the things that you know is not good for you, like I did, take up some of those, uh, you know, take up with some of those old gang members again that you used to run with, get back into your gossiping, or get back into the other things that you used to do in your old self, then the devil is going to find you. He's waiting for you, lurking, waiting for you to mess up. Are you hearing me? According to Galatians 2.20, you have, like I said, you have to realize that you were crucified with Christ and Satan no longer has any claims on you. He has no claims on you. But does that guarantee that he's going to stay off of you? No. It's just like in the witness protection program. They, 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 they have no more claims on these people. But does that mean that they're going to be forever safe? Only if they do what they've been told to do. Will we be safe? Can we prevent a lot of the things that Satan attacks us with? Yes, we can. We can protect ourselves if we will be more obedient and stay hidden in Christ. Stay just as close to our Father as we can get. Are you hearing me? Saints, God's going to fight for you and He will defend you from your enemies. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 that he will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. He said they shall come out against you one way and flee before you in seven different ways. And Exodus 14 says Moses told the people, he said, don't be afraid. He said, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue today. So just stand still today. If you're going through anything, trust the God to get you out of it. He is the only one. Humans cannot get you out of it. The only way a human can get you out of anything is if God is working through that human, yes. which is the only way that he's going to work anyway, because he's a spirit, he's going to work through. And Satan works through people too, because he's a spirit. The Egyptians, he said, you see today, will never, you'll never be seen again. The Lord himself, he says, will fight for you. Moses said, just stay calm. In 2 Peter 2, 9, it says, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Hallelujah. And 2 Timothy, the Lord says, The Lord will rescue from every evil deed and, and bring you safely into the heavenly kingdom. Hallelujah. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Saints, some people lose their battle before they ever begin because they, of how they choose to respond to their situation. When you encounter a trial or a situation in your life, regardless whether it's in your, you go to the doctor and he says something you don't want to hear, or, or your bank calls you and he tells you something you don't want to hear, it, it, it's a matter of utmost importance in that first few seconds is how you respond to that. You either receive it, you can be polite to them, hang up and say, Lord, I don't receive that report. And I, and I would begin praying and talking to the Lord about that and saying what he said about me. Just tur turn it over to him. Are you hearing me? I realize that we live in a world that's filled with evil and with challenges, and you have an adversary that's trying to kill you, and he doesn't care how he does it. You can't let intimidation, you can't let him intimidate you into quitting. David, he refused to be intimidated with Goliath. When David went up against Goliath, he saw him as a mortal man that was defying his God. And he looked at his situation from God's point of view. And that's what you have to do too, saints. You have to look at things, whatever it is you're going through this morning, through God's point of view. These were difficult times for David, but they were also the best of times. He learned to deal with danger and he also learned to fight. We have all, we have all experienced times when we have felt like that we were totally alone in our trials. However, the Lord knows that you're fighting these battles and he's here for us right in the middle of all of it. It's kind of like this poem that was written anonymous, anonymously <laughs> called One Set of Footprints. Anybody ever heard that? 
in the sand. If you don't mind, I'd like to read that to you. I've read it before, but I think this morning would be good and we're gonna close. Um, it says, one night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene, I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes he says there were two sets of footprints and other times there were only one. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I could only see one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there has only been one set of footprints in the sand. Why, when I needed you most, have you not been there for me? And the Lord replied, My precious child, I love you, and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was when I carried you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's when he was carrying us. Saints, I realize this is a poem that was written by an, anonym, by an anonymous author. However, I really feel in my spirit this morning that those of you are here this morning and listening online, I feel that most of you would have, if you, if you would admit it, could have written this poem yourself. Because there's times we feel like when we need God the most and we're going through the most biggest trials and our anguish is that we feel all by ourselves. But he's saying, that's when I'm there with you the most. That's when I'm carrying you. Hallelujah. I know there have been times when I've been tempted to wonder myself where God was in some of my trials. However, you must realize that it's always Satan that makes you think such thoughts. Yes. He's the one that makes you think those. As the Lord says in Hebrews 13, he says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And you might leave him, but he's never going to leave you. In closing, let me say this. God has a custom design plan for your life. Jesus said that his purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Saint Satan has a custom design plan to distract you and to kill you. But you have to know that the Lord is always here to help you fight your battles. And remember that if God be for you, who can be against you? And remember this, that the one chasing you is not as great as the one that's living on the inside of you. Amen. Never. The one living on the inside of you is always the greatest. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you so much for this word today. I thank you for all those that come to hear the word, to be fed by the word. I thank you, Father, for all those that are listening online. I pray over each and every one of them. I pray a special blessing over all of those here and over the, all those that are listening, Father. I pray, Lord God, that those that are being tempted today or going through trials or faced with certain situations, whatever those situations, whatever those circumstances are, Lord God, I pray that you will just cover them with your presence and surround them. You said, Holy Spirit, that you are our comforter, that you are our helper, that you are our standby. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will comfort them. And I pray that you will reveal to them that their answer is always in Jesus Christ. Their answer is not in the bank. The answer is not in the doctors in the hospital, doctor's reports. But the answer is in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. So Lord, help us never to forget that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, that you're always with us no matter what we're going through, and that you're always quick to forgive when we mess up, Lord, that you're always there to forgive us. And we thank you, Father, that your mercy is fresh and new every day and that your grace is sufficient to meet our every need. No matter what that need is, we, Father, we thank you today that your grace is sufficient. We thank you, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we praise you. We thank you for this word today and thank you for the, for the blessing that's upon it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.